I want to call the East Greenboro Central School District uh, Board of Education meeting to order for May 4th, 7 p.m. Um, board members present this evening. We have board members not here right now. Kathleen Curtin is not here, but I expect her to be. And Ms. Gamerski will not be able to make it tonight. I think that covers everybody. All right. um, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So the first part of our agenda or our meeting this evening is the public hearing on the budget. Um, we now have the call of the meeting, and will I need a motion to waive the public hearing notice? Will I need a motion to, to waive the public hearing notice? Or just read it? Just read it. Good. Yes. So I think you read the resolution. And then we'll. And then a motion to approve. Yep. So we need a, uh, the Board of Education of East Greenwood Central School District hereby waives the reading of the public hearing notice for the May 17th, 2022 vote. I need a motion to approve that. Mark, you need a second. Kathleen, all those in favor? All right. And that just saves me from reading the very long piece of uh, document there. So I appreciate that. Uh, presentation this evening is the, the school board uh, budget for 22-23, the school district budget. And I'll turn over to Mr. Simons. Thank you, Mr. Bino. I want to welcome members of the community who are participating in the meeting, our members of our board, and those that are participating via the live stream. This is our presentation of the formal budget hearing. And uh, we have had a number of presentations over the course of the last several meetings to present the board and the community our proposed budget, which will be voted on by the public on May 17th. The resolution that was just approved by the board waives the notification requirement. However, the presentation that I'm doing this evening fulfills the notification requirement. So uh, one of the things that uh, occurs for all school districts in New York State is that we are required to make sure that through the regulations of New York State that we are as transparent as possible to ensure maximum voter participation in school board budget votes and Board of Education elections. So in the public notice, we're required to make sure that citizens are informed of the location as well as the time of the public hearing. And we have had several notices that are required to be published in our newspaper of record, which we have fulfilled. We are also required to make sure that the specific budget documents, not just the presentations or the videos of the presentations, but the actual documents themselves are available for the public. So. Each board member here this evening has a consolidated document. You may recall we used to have three documents. Uh, Linda has consolidated those documents into one. There's a table of context, and this document is available online for any member of the community. And it's also, there is a paper copy here, and there are locations where you can pick up a paper copy if you want one as a citizen at the district office, at each of our respective uh, public libraries within the towns we serve as well as in the school buildings, or you can access it online. So the budget documents, specific line by line, which also includes the uh, required documents that we file with the state, are all included in that packet. And we'll go through some of those items through the presentation. We're also required to make sure that the public is aware of the voting date, which is May 17th, and each of the propositions that will be on the ballot. And we will go through each of those propositions during the presentation. There is also notification regarding the election of board members, uh, making sure that we are um, uh, informing uh, the community as to who is running for the board and also the voting districts and polling sites, how someone who may not be registered to vote can register to vote. Uh, we also talk about the period of time in which any member of the public has a right to inspect the voter registry, which is required by New York State regulations, qualifications of the voters in order to be eligible to vote, and the process to fill out an application should you be eligible for an absentee ballot. So the notice uh, to the community is published four times within 45 days prior to the May 17th vote, and we publish those uh, notices in two newspapers. I know we do the Albany Times Union and 
and the Troy record. Thank you, Ms. Wager. This notification is also available on our website for anyone to review. We are required again by regulation to make sure that these notices are published in the newspaper. Additionally, the budget packet I mentioned, which is the written document, uh, it is available at Central Administration, located uh, 29 Englewood Ave, and all school buildings. It's also located in each of the town's respective libraries, East Greenbush, North Greenbush, Sand Lake, and Nassau, and available on our website, or you can call the Office of the District Clerk, which is our business office, and you can request a copy, and we'll make sure that we get it to you. Uh, the budget packet includes a revenue, revenue summary, and as we've been talking about, we have basically two larger sources of revenue in the local property taxes and our state aid. And our state aid has increased last year and again this year. Uh, additionally, we are required to provide an expenditure summary. So you, any citizen can look at how much money we're proposing to spend in various categories those categories are uniform throughout New York State. So basically every school budget in New York State is set up using the same codes and using the same format. The property tax report card is a required document. We file that with New York State to let them know what we are proposing to uh, do uh, regarding the tax levy. Uh, again, as we have mentioned at several meetings, we are proposing a 0% increase to the tax levy and that would be reflected in the property tax report card, as well as the total revenue that we propose to receive through the levy of taxes. There's a three-part budget requirement. There's a requirement to make sure that we break down our budget into the administrative portion of the budget, the capital portion of the budget, and the program, or sometimes referred to as the instructional portion of the budget. The instructional or the program portion of the budget is the largest percentage of the budget because it generally focuses on teachers, administrators, support staff that deliver and supervise the educational program. Additionally, within the capital budget, it's generally monies that we spend, principal interest and other expenses associated with maintaining our facilities and the administrative budget, our administrative, certain administrative salaries as, other, as well as other costs for operation of the district. There is an administrative salary disclosure document that is available for public review. Uh, that document stipulates that my salary as the superintendent of schools and my benefit costs as the superintendent of schools need to be transparent. Uh, the assistant superintendent and several other administrators and there's a threshold for that which is required to be reported. So you can look on that document and you can see as part of the administrative salary disclosure, how much some of our uh, school leaders are earning and also their benefits. Additionally, we are required to report enrollment data. Our enrollment is uh, under review every year by our budget review and advisory committee. Our enrollment is generally stable within the district. And we are also required to report through the budget process the uh, number of English language learners, which it continues to increase and within our budget uh, proposed on May 17th, we are proposing adding an additional ENL teacher because of the increases in the population of students requiring those services. The New York State School Report Card, that's something that is under the auspices of Mr. McHugh, our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum. The New York State School Report Card includes data regarding academic achievement, our performance on grade three through eight English language arts and math tests, our performance on regents exams, uh, other academic information that we have highlighted over the course of the last several meetings is required to be reported. Additionally, the New York State School Report Card also tracks information regarding cost per student. And our cost per student is generally falls within two categories, our cost per student in general education and our cost per student in special education. The Every Student Succeed Act, Succeeds Act, which is referred, commonly referred to as ESSA, requires fiscal transparency. Uh, this is a report that we have to file every year that not only breaks down our budget across the district, but it breaks down our budget by school building and level. And it's something that Mrs. Wager works on to make sure that everyone knows that how we are distributing the budget over all of the schools and categorizing it 
based on enrollment and other factors uh, in terms of making sure that the state wants to make sure that every school is provided with resources equitably. The property tax exemption report lists properties within the district's boundaries which are eligible for exemption from property taxes. And then we also include each of the four ballot propositions, which I will be speaking about this evening. So all that information is in the budget packet. Linda has organized that information, Ms. Wager, very well. There's a table of contents in there. And if anyone ever has any questions about any of those documents in the budget packet, they should feel free to either call my office or the business office. We'd be happy to answer any questions uh, or concerns you may have. Voting again is on May 17th. The voting polls will open at 7 a.m. They close at 9 p.m. We are losing, using the electronic voting machines as we've done in the past. Uh, we are also going to talk about three board candidates who have uh, fulfilled the requirements. And we will be talking about those board candidates uh, that citizens will have an opportunity to vote on uh, on May 17th. One of the factors that school districts have to be uh, mindful of in putting together the budget is the New York State tax cap formula. The New York State tax cap formula is a formula that varies by district depending on various factors such as the, um, the rate of growth in the, your property tax base, uh, the amount of uh, funds within your budget that could be excluded from the tax cap for such things as principal and interest payments on capital projects. The other area that affects the property tax cap is the pilot revenues, which we've talked about in the past payment in lieu of taxes agreements. And this, what this graph represents is our board's record over several years of making sure that when we propose a budget to the community, we remain in the within the tax cap. That we propose a budget that does not exceed the amount that New York State indicates uh, through the minimum property tax, allowable property tax cap. Uh, and each year and every year, the blue line here represents what we could have taxed to remain within the cap and where, where we're coming out and actually proposing the tax levy. You can see for the last two years, we have remained at a 0% tax increase. We've been able to do that, but also maintain our academic and extracurricular programs, keep our class sizes low to be able to address student needs, keep all of our elective courses, including our college credit courses and our AP courses, in part because of past fiscal responsibility, on the part of our board, we've been able to uh, maintain reserves, appropriating at about $6.8 million, a fund balance towards the budget next year, but also because we have received last year and this year uh, significant increases in state aid, and we also have federal aid. So we're very pleased that we are coming out to the community on May 17th with a budget that, again, for the second year in a row, proposes not to raise the tax levy and again, that's in large part because of the work that the board has done uh, and the increases in state and federal resources. Uh, residents of the town of Sand Lake and Chatham uh, and residents with Nassau mailing addresses vote at voting location number one, which is Donald P. Southern Elementary School. To my knowledge, the school voting places have not changed in many, many years. So most people who have been residents of the district for a while will be familiar with this information, but we have new people that come in and we wanna make sure they know where they can vote. vote voting location number two is Green Meadow Elementary School. Uh, residents of the town of Skodak, as well as uh, who do not have a Nassau mailing address would vote in Green Meadow Elementary School. Residents of the town of Greenbush vote at the middle school, Howard L. Goff Middle School. Uh, that tends to be our largest polling place. Is that not right, Mrs. Wager? Uh, so East Greenbush residents vote at Goff. And uh, residents of North Greenbush vote at Belltop Elementary School. Uh, we have folks that are approved by the board to uh, maintain and manage the election uh, and the vote every year. We're grateful that people from the community 
help us to um, make sure that people know how to vote, assist, make sure it's done in accordance with all of the election requirements. Uh, to register to vote in a school budget, school board election, you only have to worry about registering if you have not voted in a school budget or board vote uh, within the last four years. You have to be um, registered through either Rensselaer County Board of Elections, or you can come to the district office, see our district clerk, which is Jean, there's Jean Bangburn right behind me, and she will help you register anytime between the hours of eight and four on a regular business day. Uh, so that's probably the more convenient way, I would say, to register for, to vote. Additionally, uh, between May 11th and May 16th, we are required by regulations to have available for review. Any citizen can come in and review the registration of voters or the register of voters. Typically, that doesn't happen, but in the interest of transparency, this is a requirement that uh, citizens have the right to review the registration of voters. We will also have uh, this available from 8 to 4 during business hours, but also on Saturday, May 14th, uh, from 9 to noon, uh, the district clerk's office will be open if any citizens want to come and review the voter registry. In order to be able to vote on the school budget and the Board of, Ele Board of Education election, you need to be a citizen of the United States, you need to be 18 years of, old, of age, you need to be a resident of the district for at least 30 days prior to the day of the vote, and you need to be registered to vote. Absentee ballots. You may remember a couple of years ago when, during COVID when we, we did mail-in uh, applications, excuse me, mail-in ballots. We no longer do mail-in ballots. We're back to the system where eligible citizens can request through an application an absentee ballot. So you have to come in or, uh, and get an application. You can receive that from the district clerk or you can go online and the applications are available on our website. The applications are due back to the district. If you're mailing them, they need to be postmarked by May 10th. Is that right? If you're planning on bringing them in in person, you can bring them in up to May 16th. And then once that application is turned in and reviewed, you'd be issued an absentee ballot. The ballots are due back by May 17th before 5 p.m., which is the day of the vote. So if you're, an if you're requesting an absentee ballot, you should make sure that that ballot gets in by 5 o'clock to the district office of the district clerk by 5 o'clock the day of the vote. How do you determine whether someone is eligible to receive an absentee ballot. If any individual within our community who's qualified to vote is hospitalized, they're eligible for an absentee ballot. Physical disability or illness, I believe that also includes uh, COVID-related uh, concerns under the category of illness. So if someone has COVID-related concerns about physically coming in and voting, they can still vote under the category of illness. If you're away on business, on vacation, or incarcerated, you still are eligible to vote. And if there are any questions or information needed regarding the absentee ballot process, uh, folks are invited to call the district clerk at 518-207-2535. Our budget that we're proposing to the community on May 17th, and we've talked a lot about our students We've talked a lot about the success of our faculty. We've talked about the board's direction to make sure that every student has opportunities to be successful within our district with multiple pathways, whether they want to go to a two-year college, a four-year college, graduate and enter into the military, or go into career and technical and trade. So our board realigned its goals this year, and our goals are reflected within the budget. We want to make sure that we have a safe, engaging educational experience for all of our students with an emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion. As I've been saying at our presentations, we want to make sure that every student, every faculty and staff member, every parent, and every visitor to our school community feels welcome and can be successful. 
Additionally, we want to be progressive, innovative, and make sure that we have lots of different options for kids to be successful, academic options, extracurricular options, and those options that facilitate students that might want to learn about the trades. We have more students participating in current technical education right now uh, at Quest Arbosis and also in the P-TECH program uh, than any other district in the uh, Quest, Quest Star region. Additionally, we want to make sure that we can recruit, uh, hire, retain, support, provide professional development for the best people that are available to deliver the services to the kids. And so our budget reflects that effort, that our budget makes sure that our people are supported and that we can recruit and find uh, the best folks to deliver the services to the kids. And we have many positive relationships with our partners in the community, including our parents, our parent-teacher organizations, our local colleges, our businesses and industries, among many other groups that support our school district. And they have been instrumental, not only uh, during this pandemic, but in terms of helping us think about uh, what the kids need and what they're going to have to do uh, when they graduate from high school and one of the examples of that would be our business, uh, our education business partnership, our business advisory committee. Uh, additionally, our PTOs have been instrumental in supporting our kids and our staffs, particularly during this COVID experience, to bring the extras. Uh, they're also a lifeline, I think, to all of our families. They provide a, a barometer of how our families are feeling about the school the education that we provide, and um, we, we couldn't educate our students as successfully if it wasn't for our families and our parents and our, and our partners. So what will citizens see on the ballot when they come to the polls on May 17th? We are proposing a budget of $104.8 million. That's the spending plan for next school year. It doesn't mean that we have to spend all $104.8 million. We try to be conservative within the budget. We try to save money throughout the year but we're proposing a $104.8 million budget. We're also proposing to use $752,000 that has been set aside and approved by the community and by the board for the purchase of additional school buses. We replace uh, higher mileage buses, uh, buses we trade them in, and we try to get newer buses that have uh, uh, you know, better safety features in some cases. Uh, better fuel economy and others, and we'll talk about the buses in just a little bit. We also have a new proposal for a capital reserve. The capital reserve functions very similar to the transportation reserve. The community has to approve the reserve, the establishment of the reserve, as does the Board of Education. This reserve is intended to set aside any available monies that we might have both now and in the future to lower the local share cost, a portion of a future project, a capital project, for example, we're doing a construction project right now that was approved in 2017. Using monies that are available in the capital reserve for certain repairs and renovations and uh, issues that we need to address within our facilities lowers the amount of money that the district has to borrow for that capital project work. Each year in the annual budget, and you can see this in the budget documents that have been sent to you, we have a line in the budget called debt service. That debt service line represents interest and principal payments that the district is making every year on previous school construction projects. Setting aside some of the money in the capital reserve to dedicate it towards the project lowers that amount of interest and principal payments that is spread out over the budget, generally over a 15 year period. So we're hoping that this would be another mechanism to sh save money long term for our community, but also address our facilities. We have very nice school facilities. However, they are older facilities and they require uh, necessary repairs and renovations. Anything that costs more than $10,000 requires state education department approval and really has to be approved through a capital project. So we're going to have more work that's gonna to need to be done in the course of the next three to five years. We're doing a building condition survey, which is a required review 
of all our facilities. This is a mechanism to save the local taxpayers portion of some of those future costs. Additionally, we have the election of three available seats on the board, uh, and those are for three-year terms. The transportation reserve, uh, we're planning to, again, purchase new buses. There are eight new buses at a cost of $752,000. We plan to purchase, if approved by the voters, three 66 passenger buses, three 35 passenger buses, and two wheelchair buses. The capital reserve I spoke about, one of the things that's important, the second bullet, is the, the board decides every year whether or not they're going to put any money in the capital reserve. Okay? They can put, the amount that they choose to put in the capital reserve is at the discretion of the board. However, the fund is limited. We can only put a total of $5 million into the fund over a period of 10 years. And we wait until the end of the year to see how we're doing within the budget, whether there's any extra money, how the board might choose to use that money. But this proposition is simply saying to the community, do you give us permission to set up this reserve? But once the reserve is set up, the board has the discretion to choose how much money they'll put into the reserve. And then down the road, when we have another capital project, the board can recommend to the community how much of that capital reserve money they would want to dedicate towards the project. And the expenditure of those funds is required to be approved both by the board and the community. So hypothetically, three to five years from now, we come out with another project. Okay, the project, let's say the project is a $40 million project. The last one was 39.7. Okay, and if we had, let's say two and a half million dollars or $3 million in the capital reserve, uh, the board would weigh how much money based on the recommendations of the administration they want to recommend come out of that reserve towards the project. We present all that data, what that would do to the total cost of the project over a 15 year period. But the community gets to decide to vote on the project and they also get to decide whether or not they're gonna authorize the district to uh, allocate the capital reserve monies towards that project. So what we're doing here on May 17th is simply asking the community to give us permission to set up this fund. Additionally, uh, we have the election of three board candidates. There are three vacant seats and there are three members of the community running for the board. Jennifer O'Brien, who is an incumbent member of the board. Jennifer, say hello. Okay. We have Michelle Cakley Skamerski. Michelle is not able to be here this evening. And we have Emily Steinbach, who is right here in the audience. We thank Emily for stepping forward and wanting to serve on our Board of Education. If the budget passes on May 17th, we will enact the budget and we'll go forward with our planning for September. Uh, if the budget is not approved, we can resubmit uh, the budget to the community for a second vote. We can revise the budget and come up with a different budget, present that to the community, or we can adopt a contingency budget, which would come, become effective July 1st. Contingency budgets are not good for the community. They tend, tend to restrict uh, the categories in which we can spend money, limits on equipment, for example, and also uh, things such as uh, community use of space within our schools are limited. We don't anticipate that. Uh, but we just want to explain uh, what a contingency budget is all about. In effect, the contingency budget would require a 0% tax increase, and we're already doing that. With that, I'll take any questions or concerns about the proposed budget or the uh, voting process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Simons. In the uh, presentation section, then we have the also do have item B is the introduction of candidates for board of education, including the ballot order. I think we already did that. So, Emily, welcome. Unless you want to see something again, Jennifer. Okay. Mm -hmm. you want me to say something? It's up to you. Oh. 
You're welcome oh, to. Sure. Um, I've enjoyed my time thus far on the board. I was appointed in November, and um, now I'm just not deciding to run for the position. I think there's a lot of positive things happening in the district, and I'd like to continue um, to serve the community. Thank you, Jennifer. Emily, would you like to say anything? No? It's up to you. Well, first, I want to say hello to everyone, and thank you for allowing me to come today. Um, I'm seeking my first term on the school board. I have a long history of working in uh, the public sector. I um, have worked in healthcare, in policy, um, with the New York State budget. Currently, I'm a contract negotiator, um, and I have experience um, with healthcare transformation, um, solutions-based uh, outcomes, and I'm a rational and uh, forward thinker. Um, I also would like to say that um, I do believe that government should benefit all people and transparency is always best. I believe that board members must first be good listeners and understand uh, the concerns of our entire community, and that includes families, students, educators, staff um, as well. Um, in order to set the stage for a successful educational experience, I feel like we must be focused on providing uh, for well-rounded students, which includes the emotional, social, and mental health of them. I also wholeheartedly believe that academic excellence looks different for every child, and it's um, great to see that the district uh, makes many efforts for that. And I believe that every child who enters our school system at any point uh, deserves multiple opportunities to reach their highest potential, whatever that looks like for them. Um, I do have experience with um, two board committees, and I have attended board meetings. Uh, I'm a Capital uh, Region native, uh, and we're very happy to call East Greenbush home. Um, I live with my wife, son, and two dogs. <laughs> you can frequently find us at the Town Park Playground, on a nearby trail, or walking our dogs in our neighborhood. I am um, a also a friend of the East Greenbush Community Library. And I also want to say thank you, she's not here, but to Michelle. I originally reached out to her a couple years ago about her role on the board, and um, she really helped me navigate this process. So I'd like to acknowledge that, um, her efforts. And I, um, again, want to um, say thank you. I look forward to this opportunity and serving our community. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. We'll now move to the uh, public comment period. Uh, I'll be reading the uh, item here. Are there any co public comments on the, the budget at this time? No, nope. seeing none, we'll move to the Board of Education comments. I'll start on my left with Cheryl. Any comments? John? I just would like to uh, thank the administrative team for putting together such a thoughtful budget without having uh, lost sight of our vision and goals for the district and most importantly to the public for their support and just because we have a zero percent tax increase please encourage everyone to come out and vote and support the school community thank you thank you john good points there mark Oops. jennifer um i just you know agree with what john said i think we have a really solid budget and i think you did a great presentation jeff in terms of making it um understandable and kind of paring it down to the um, important facts. So I encourage everyone to come out and vote on May 17th. Thank you, Jennifer. Kathleen? Uh, I particularly want to say thank you to Jennifer, Michelle, and Aaron. Emily. Emily, sorry. <laughs> um, for stepping up because it's it can be a lot of work, but it's very, very rewarding. And so it's really exciting to see new people wanting to come in. And I also want to say, I'm sorry to see that Frank will be finishing his term with us, but as he said, um, he knows there's always work to be done and he could be coming back. So <laughs> we, we might get Frank 2.0 at another time, but thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Joanne? Good. Frank? Fantastic presentation, Joe. Thank you. I don't have any comments this time. So with that, I need a motion to close the public hearing. Joanne, I need a second. Cheryl, all those in favor? The public hearing is closed. Moving on to our regular board agenda. I just clicked out of it, so I'll have to wait a second. <clears throat> All right. Get back on track. 
So I will call the regular Board of Education meeting to order, 7.35. Um, attendance, all board members are in attendance except for Ms. Skamersky. Uh, with the board's consent, I'll waive the reading uh, of the Pledge of Allegiance since we already did it. And we will move on to the Student Council with Ryan and Emma. Hello everyone, uh, thanks for having us tonight. So, uh, right now, Student Council is really focusing on the end of your events, specifically the award ceremony uh, and the elections, and then our class councils are focusing on prom and related activities. Uh, so here's a breakdown of all that, how it's gonna be working. <laughs> Uh, the Student Council election process will begin on Monday, May 16th, when prospective candidates will receive access to a questionnaire uh, where they can explain to us uh, on the Elections Committee why they believe they would ser serve students best. On May 19th, uh, we will have received all applications and we'll post a list of eligible candidates who can begin campaigning right away. Uh, they will have until the following Wednesday, May 25th, to campaign and voting will begin that morning and will end Thursday at noon, and on the same Thursday, uh, we will announce who won the elections and will be serving for the 2022-2023 uh, school year, yeah. Um, the junior prom will be hosted in the uh, Columbia Gymnasium on Saturday, May, May 14th from 7 to 11 p.m. The freshman class will host the walk-ins for the junior prom earlier that evening, and the senior prom will be hosted in the Desmond Hotel on Friday, June 10th, and the sophomore class will host that walk-in at the CHS Auditorium before seniors head over to Albany. The Columbian Awards Ceremony will be hosted in the CHS Auditorium on the morning of Friday, June 10th. This is a student-run ceremony, and we are very happy that it is happening live and in person this year, and there, awards from the school and faculty will be announced. On Tuesday, June 14th, the evening awards ceremony will take place, where awards and scholarships from third parties will be announced. And in other news, seniors wore shirts to display their post-grad plans on Monday, whether it be college, career, trade, or military. And finally, the annual Columbia Talent Show is coming back and will be hosted on May 20th after school. I suggest everyone go. I know I have some friends uh, singing there, so I highly suggest it. And that is all we have for tonight. Thank you very much. Did you say you're singing, right? Uh, no, I do not possess that <laughs> talent, but I do have some friends that do. And how did I know? <laughs> Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Moving on to the next item is the minutes. We have no draft minutes of putting forth um, for a vote this time. Board forum, our first board forum. I'll just open it up. Anyone have any comments for the regular meeting? No. Moving on to the next item is the, is the public forum. Residents, students, employees, and the business representatives of the East Greenwood Central School District may address the board on matters concerning programs and or operations of the district other than matters involving personnel. <clears throat> Members of the board do not directly respond to citizens' concerns in the public forum. If a response is appropriate, either the president or superintendent will contact the individual in the near future. Those persons wishing to address the board will be recognized by the chair of the meeting and should state for the record their name, and address, or affiliation with the district or business. While the board does not wish to infringe upon free speech protections, it must be stressed that the visitor's forum is not deemed to be an open forum. The board president will conduct the forum for the orderly and efficient operation of board business. In addition, any remarks which be considered defamatory or stigmatizing or prohibited will be declared out of order. All comments shall be limited to five minutes. Is there anyone who'd like to address the board this time? No? Okay. We'll now move on to the discussion items, which is special grants. Mr. Simons? I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Cannon, who is okay. the chair of the special grants committee. Uh, Mrs. Curtin also serves on that committee. Thank you, Mr. Simons. Um, our committee met on uh, April 11th this year to review quite a few uh, special grants applications. It was myself, Kathleen Curtin, Helen Squalachi, Allison Hosier, Dan Wagner, and Nicole Maney. Um, the intent of special grants is to provide an educational experience to our EGTA members um, with the belief that those experiences will enrich and enhance the members' expertise in their um, specific subject area. Um, we were quite pleased to see the interest increase uh, this year as uh, in years past, we've only seen about two or three <laughs> due to the pandemic, but um, interest is back up. Um, we uh, had a lot of difficult decisions to make. Um, I think this is probably one of our hardest years where we had to go back historically and look at who um, was awarded a special grant in the past, um, which conferences have been attended in the past. 
um, and we um, first tried to look at um, those applicants who haven't had the opportunity yet. Um, so uh, the memo that um, we have prepared um, lists the staff member that applied for the grant, the conference or the program that they would like to attend. Uh, many, as you'll see, are either state or national conferences. Um, the amount requested by that applicant and then the amount our special grants committee is recommending. Um, there is in the contract language that we are able to approve up to $40,000 per year in special grants. Um, the amount we are recommending this year is $38,097.05. Um, the reason for that is if um, any applicant um, uh, has a change in price as they go through the process will be a little left over where we could um, assist them with that and then um, unfortunately um, we had to uh, deny uh, four grants um, this year but it was definitely after a lot of deliberation and some hard work so if you have any questions we'd be happy to take that at this time board members any questions Kathleen any comments did you sit on the committee uh, no, this is my probably fifth or sixth year on this committee, <laughs> yep. and I look forward to it every year. It's very exciting to see um, all of our staff members looking for all these new opportunities. Great. Yep. Definitely a, a wide variety of, of, and I appreciate the work of the committee and for the staff that are, uh, have researched this uh, information to go to the conferences and get that professional learning that uh, they're looking to do. So. Next steps with this, uh, Marissa? Um, the next step would be at the next board meeting, I'm putting it on the consent for approval. Very good, okay. Any other questions, board members? Good, all right. That concludes our discussion items. We have a regular business, approval of Columbia High School Lighting Controls project bid. Uh, some explanation, Linda or Jeff? I'll give a general explanation, and I think Linda and Paul Bickle is here as well. I think, Paul, you're back there, right? So um, one of the things we've been doing within the current capital project, uh, among many things, is uh, in our schools we've been updating the lighting controls. The lighting controls that we have uh, installed in several buildings uh, provide energy efficiency, savings of energy, and actually respond to the amount of natural light that is coming into a space, such as a classroom or an office. They're the kind of lighting controls that when the, the room is not occupied, the lights shut off. Uh, and uh, initially in the uh, planning of this phase of the project, we weren't sure we had enough money within the project to do with the entire high school. So we pulled it out of the project, uh, bid out other aspects of the work, and then have re-put it into the project because we had money left over. So this was intended to be done as part of the initial capital project. We pulled it out, then we put it back in. Uh, Paul, if you wanna talk a little bit about the bids and uh, the, what's involved in this work, I think that would be very informative to the board. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Simons. So um, as Mr. Simons said, we've been carefully uh, picking and choosing what we could do throughout this project based on the available funds. Um, Fortunately, a lot of bids have come back um, favorable for the district recently. Um, there are some unfavorable things, um, manpower shortages, um, shortages of equipment and uh, materials, things like that, that may seem like they've, they're drawing out the project a little bit. But um, in actuality, the phase three of the project will be finished by the end of this summer. Um, these new phases uh, that we're adding, the lighting phase being one of them, is actually going to be an extension of that. So it's utilizing extra funds that we had and actually um, things that were originally approved by the voters that we want to try to get in. So we want to try to make sure that we're uh, capturing everything, getting all those items in there if possible. Uh, this was originally uh, supposed to be a, about a million dollar project, this lighting bid project. Uh, after the favorable bidding that we got for phase three of the project, we 
uh, reworked some numbers and we put this out at an estimated at five hundred thousand dollars, and the bids actually came in under that um, in the the mid fours. I don't know the exact number, but uh, right around four hundred and seventy five thousand dollars in that range, and uh, that'll allow us to complete the project at all the schools and buildings, um, which is good because it was originally voted and uh, but. Uh, approved so um but also above and beyond that you know we do have some additional funds that we can continue on and look at so we're we're kind of chipping away at things trying to be smart about it and uh see where we're left off as far as funds go um we have some additional things we'd like to still get done too um but just be aware that those are in addition to the capital project they we didn't originally think we were going to get them in. So some of these things, uh, the lighting project is scheduled to start this fall um, here in Columbia. Uh, it'll be second shift work. And uh, we also have a handful of other items that we'd like to look at and see if we can possibly get done as well. So um, just a quick overview of lighting controls, uh, as J Mr. Simon has touched on it. It's basically really about efficiency. It's about um, when you walk into a room, the lights turn on. When you walk out, they turn off at a timed amount. So it's it's all about um, making the buildings more efficient. Sure. So, yeah. and obviously Columbia is a huge electric drawer. So, you know, yeah. we're, we're we're trying to uh, definitely get this one knocked out, and uh, we'll go from there. Does anybody have any questions? Thanks, Paul. Yep, no problem. It's good to see that we we can utilize some of those other funds in the in the in the project. With that, I need a motion to approve the project bid. Kathleen, second, Frank. All those in favor? Approved. Committee reports. Any committee reports besides? Don't believe we have any committee. Marissa, Linda. Okay. Okay. Table motions. We have none at this time. A little business. I have nothing. Board members, anything? No. Good. Going to the consent agenda, items A through F. Any questions or comments on the consent agenda? No. Seeing none, any motion to approve the consent agenda? John, second. Mark, all those in favor? Approved. New business, board members, anything to bring to the table? Let's see nothing. Moving on, we have our second public forum. Any from, from the public like to address the board at this time? Okay. And board members, any other comments? I won't formally go around this time, but feel free to comment. Okay. Seeing nothing there. Um, we do have need for executive session, Mr. Simons, uh, for the purposes of contractual negotiations. Okay. We uh, don't anticipate any other board business after the executive session. So with that, I need a motion to move into executive session. Kathleen, second. John, all those in favor? Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.